Hi, my name is Katie Gottenhorn, and I am a graduate student at Florida International University. And today I'm going to give a little presentation and tutorial about reproducible data visualization in Python. So this is going to be an introduction to data, data visualization using three different Python packages that give pretty great functionality for visualizing data and customizing plots. These are Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Nylon. And we have a couple of objectives for this tutorial. They are to first plot bivariate relationships using Matplotlib and Seaborn, then to kind of tweak these plots, update the colors, legends, and axes with Matplotlib. Then we're going to make some multi-panel figures with Matplotlib and Seaborn, and finally plot some statistical brain maps using Nylon. So all of the code and data used to run this tutorial are available on GitHub at this link here. And you can run this tutorial without installing or downloading anything using Binder. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And here is the repository with all the code and data. And if you'd like to follow along in Jupyter Notebooks, you can go ahead and click this link right here, which is going to launch our Binder instance. And while it starts up, let's go ahead and walk through some of the, um, the notebooks that we have here. So first, we've got the all code plus outputs notebook, which is a Jupyter Notebook containing all of the code and all of it's already been evaluated so you can see all the outputs in line. Um, then we have the all code and just code notebooks, which are just what they sound like. They have all of the code in the all code and outputs notebook, but none of the outputs. So you can just see um, all of the code and run it if you'd like to in order without getting a peek kind of at the outputs before we get to them. And finally, we have the live coding notebook, which is what I'm going to use. Um, to run this tutorial and show you all how to make some beautiful figures. So we're going to go ahead and get this guy started up. And this is a data visualization tutorial that's based on one given by Kirsty Whitaker at the New York Academy in 2019. Um, over the years, I have adapted it and kind of tweaked some stuff and added in a little bit of brain plotting to the end, so stay tuned. But what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to plot our data with Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Nylearn. And what we're going to do in the first part of this tutorial is create a figure that is very much like a figure that I had in an old version of a manuscript that's currently in preparation about how the functional organization of the brain is related to IQ in a sample of physics students during their very first physics course. This tutorial is going to recreate some plots of network topology against IQ for female and male, male students learning physics in two different classroom environments. And the philosophy of this uh, tutorial is to just take what you need. So I'm borrowing this uh, philosophy from Kirsty. I think it suits this tutorial very well because what we're going to do is we're going to start off by making very simple plots and we're going to kind of work our way up to a publication standard but you should only take the parts that you need and leave the rest behind. If you don't care about making fancy legends or setting a particular number of X ticks on the X axis that you can kind of tune out when we get to those parts. But the goal of the tutorial overall is just to leave feeling like you know how to get started writing some code to visualize your data and customize some plots. And in addition to this tutorial, there are so many good resources available online. Particularly, Seaborn and Nylon have very rich galleries and tutorials that show you how to make all sorts of different plots to visualize your data in lots of different ways. And we'll kind of take a look through each of those galleries a little bit later. But first off, we are going to import all the tools that we need. First off, some tools for managing data and doing a little bit of statistics, just a very little bit. And then some, a tool that will allow us to visualize our data and um, plots inline in this notebook. And then our very first tool, matplotlib, we're going to import a module called pyplot as plt. So every time you see plt throughout the course of this notebook, it is referring to matplotlib. And we're going to make sure that we can visualize those plots that we make inline in this notebook using a little bit of Python magic. And next up is Seaborn, which, which we are going to import as SNS. So again, every time you see SNS, we're referring to Seaborn. And finally, we're going to import the plotting module from Nylearn. Nylearn has a lot of great tools that you can use to analyze and process neuroimaging data, but we're just going to take a, a look at the plotting tools today. And finally, I'm going to ignore some warnings. 
because I don't want them to gum up this nice tutorial. So we'll go ahead and run that cell. And if you aren't familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you can run cells using shift return. And that'll run the code in the cell. But some context first on the data and the questions that we're going to use them to answer here today. Um, we did a study at Florida International University a few years ago that looked at inter introductory physics students and asked them to lie in an MRI scanner and complete a series of memory and reasoning tasks. So in this study, we ask students to complete a series of tasks, but the task we're going to focus on today required students to engage in physics reasoning to answer conceptual questions about Newtonian mechanics from the force concept inventory or FCI. So the FCI questions, as shown in an example here on the left, show diagrams of objects in motion and ask participants questions about these diagrams so they would have to draw on their knowledge of the laws of physics to answer these questions. And then we have our control condition, which had a bunch of questions that are perceptually matched to the FCI questions. And instead of asking about physics or some sort of um, implied reasoning questions, we just asked them perception questions so they represent a really pretty nice high level baseline that um, requires students to do the same sort of like perceptual processing, but not the added component of reasoning. And while the answers to the FCI questions demonstrate different conceptions about the laws of physics, the answers to the control questions are just comparisons about um, the images shown. And we're going to use these data to address a couple of hypotheses. Our first is that there will be a relationship between full-scale IQ as measured by the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale um, and brain organization while students are answering the physics reasoning questions, but not while students are answering the control questions. We are further going to hypothesize that these relationships are different with respect to course type, so whether students were in an active lecture or an active learning or a lecture class, and whether or not these relationships further differ differed based on student sex. And before we get started plotting things, I just want a final note, with great power comes great responsibility. I've listed some hypotheses above, but of course we cannot confirm or reject them using just visualizing the data. Um, just because a line looks like it goes up or down does not mean that it is statistically significantly doing so. And we all know you can tell lots of stories with a picture and we just wanna make sure that we are not uh, misleading anybody when we make these figures. So be careful, be responsible, and here we go. The data we're going to use are stored in this binder image um, in a small CSV, which is just a subset of variables from the larger study. There are a few important columns. The first three are demographic information, so students' age, year in school, and sex, which is demi-coded as female or not female. And then the fourth is uh, the class variable, so it is another demi-coded variable representing the course type in which the student was enrolled when they took their introductory physics class. So either in an active lecture or active learning or uh, modeling class or in a traditional lecture class. And then we have the post full scale IQ variable, which contains our post instruction full scale least scores. And we've got our brain variables. So that's these two guys right here, which is characteristic path length calculated from fMRI data collected while students were performing the aforementioned tasks under the FCI and control conditions. So we have path length during physics, path length during control. And then you've got students' head size and uh, head movement during the physics and control conditions, which we're going to use um, as covariates in one of our later analyses. But first, we're going to go ahead and read in these data using um, pandas. So pandas. And we're going to save them in a data frame called df, which is what we're going to use to make all of our plots and run all of our statistics later in this tutorial. So we're going to read in the data, took a late, take a look at the first few rows using the head function from pandas, and then we're going to look at the column names, which can be really handy if you want to copy and paste column names as you use this data throughout the tutorial instead of trying to type it all and avoid typos. And then we're going to take a brief look at some descriptive statistics. So here we go. Here is the first five rows of our data. We can see all of our variables and a few of their values. The column names, so this is all the data we have in this data frame. And then our summary statistics. 
So as you can see in the summary statistics, the values of characteristic path length are orders of magnitude smaller than the value of IQ. Um, and because these particular absolute values of path length are not really informative to us, and because they're so much smaller than the IQ values, we're going to go ahead and normalize those path length values so that they have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, which will give us a little bit more information as we walk through instead of what exactly the characteristic path length is in the brain during physics questions and control questions. Instead, we'll have um, a comparative scale of how many standard deviations away from the mean individual students are in their characteristic path length under these conditions. So we're going to go ahead and get started by making a very quick scatter plot. And we're just going to plot um, IQ on the x-axis and path length on the y-axis. And we're going to start by plotting path length during physics reasoning. So we're going to use the scatter function from matplotlib and pull those data directly out of the data frame. Let me use tab completion because it makes life easier. Oh, no, there you go. I'm going to choose the normalized values and there you have it. We have plotted path length during physics reasoning across IQ. So what about the relationship between IQ and path length during the control condition. We're beginning to address our first hypothesis, so let's take a look at the other relationship here. We'll scale IQ against control condition normalized path length, and okay, cool. So we've made two plots, they look nice. Um, I think it would be very much more helpful if we plotted them on the same plot, especially considering our hypotheses. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll do this again really quick. IQ, grab physics path length. I'm gonna copy and paste to save time. Grab control path. Up. All right. So look at that. Matplotlib is very clever. Um, it assumed correctly that because we ran these two lines in the same cell, that it wanted the, that we wanted to plot both of these plots on the same axis. And so it did that. Um, if we had, however, called plt.show between those two lines, we would have added, ended up with two different plots. Let's see what that looks like now here. There you go. So if you called show plot in the middle of these two commands, it would show the first and then make the second and also show it just like this. Alrighty, so we have achieved objective one. We have plotted a bivariate relationship with our data in a simple scatter plot. And this shows us exactly how easy it can be to plot some data and to get started with visualization in Python. This can be a really great place to stop if you're just interested in making sure that your data are on the scale that you want them to be um, to check for weird outliers, make sure that the patterns are generally what you would expect. Um, and if your goal is just to explore your data, you can go ahead and stop here and kind of tune me out for a little bit. But if you are interested in having a little bit more control over your plots, then we're going to go ahead and move forward and introduce the concepts of a matplotlib figure and axis. Uh, we're not going to dive into these topics really because that gets us down the rabbit hole of the matplotlib object-oriented architecture. Um, and if you are interested in that, you can go ahead and follow this link right here to a tutorial. But for the purposes of this tutorial, um, all you need to know is that a figure is a figure. Cool. Um, that's the canvas on which you're going to make your beautiful visualization. And it can contain multiple axes that describe or that display different aspects of your data or plot. So that makes it a little bit easier to understand why people do these things. If you think about a paper you've seen recently where I might have had like figure one had A, B, C, and D with different blocks. So figure one is our figure A, B, C, and D are different axes. And we can visualize this pretty simply using code if we use these subplots commands. So a simple way to, to set this up is to specify that we're creating a figure and an axis using the PLT subplots command. Um, so we can run this all by itself. And there we have it. We have a figure with one empty axis. And if you're interested in a little bit more information about the subplots command, you can follow this stack overflow answer and read some more about it. But let's go ahead and add some plots to our figure. 
So we're going to do that same setup as before. And we are going to add our scatter plots to this axis. First, we're going to do our physics reasoning. And then we'll copy and paste that guy and change this to our control reasoning. Or, sorry, our control questions. And we are going to use plt.show to show this plot. And just like that, we have both of these plots on the same figure and on the same axis. Um, so did you notice that when we plotted them this time, instead of using plt.scatter, we used axe.scatter. So that's because we are being a little bit more particular about where we want these data plotted. Specifically, we created an axis on our figure and we want to plot both of these plots on that one axis. And we also um, explicitly told Jupiter where we wanted to plot these plots with plt.show. Um, this was not a thing that you needed to run, but it is good practice if you're going to start coding up notebooks with lots of plots. Um, you don't want to accidentally have them all go on the same axis, so it's nice to be um, very straightforward about when you want to show these figures. And by showing a figure, like we saw earlier, it is not going to continue to put more plots on that figure. Unless you tell it to, of course. So we are going to go ahead and add a regression line to our scatter plots. So you take a, a little bit of a closer look at the relationship between these variables. Um, so first off, I'm going to go ahead and sort by our x values. This will make the line plotting a little bit easier. And we're going to use stats models to fit an ordinary least squares regression to this equation, which is just regressing path length on IQ scores. Um, what we're going to do here is we're also going to save the predicted values of y so that we can use them um, in creating these line plots a little bit later. So let's go ahead and run that cell. Beautiful. And so now we have progression outputs um, from stats models along with our predicted y values for characteristic path length during physics and during the control conditions. And we've saved those in our data frame too. So now, in addition to our scatter plots, we are going to add some line plots using the same x values. But this time, we're going to use the predicted values. So I'm going to go for physics first. Now let's copy and paste that and grab control second. Alrighty, there we have it. So now we have all our points and in, in addition to those points, two lines. Um, it looks fine, but the lines are a little bit thin compared to the points. So let's go ahead and start customizing our plot and bump things up a little bit. So to those lines, we are going to add a line width argument. Paste it below. So now we're going to have some thicker lines. Ta da! All right, looks better. Um, but none of this is labeled. So we don't know what orange and blue represent in terms of our data. So we're going to go ahead and add a legend to the plot. So this uh, function is called axe.legend. And we don't have to tell it the labels directly, but we are going to add the label attributes to our data in these scatter plots. So we've got label equals physics for the physics data, label equals control for the control data. Let's go ahead and add a legend. All right. So matplotlib did not label the lines uh, because we did not give the lines labels. So that's pretty nice. It just assumes that we only wanted to label the things that we explicitly gave labels above. And the label positioning in matplotlib is pretty clever. So what it's done is it's put our uh, legend in the place with the fewest dots. And that'll change based on the size of the legend. So if you have 
Um, if you want to know a little bit more about setting the position of your legend, there is some documentation linked here that shows you how to do that. The default value for the location of the legend is best. As you can see, it picked the best spot. So we can keep that for the rest of the notebook. But if you really wanted to put it somewhere, you could explicitly set the location. So what we're going to do is we're going to add to legend using the loc attribute. We're going to say center. So let's put it in the center of the right hand side. And so that looks dreadful, um, but that's okay. Now we know that we can change things and we'll just go ahead and set it back to best, which is the same as leaving it empty because best is the default, but there it is. Now it's in the best spot because matplotlib knows best. Okay, so now the fact that we've got blue dots for physics and a blue line for physics and orange dots for control and an orange line for control is only because of the order that we put these plots on the figure or on the axis. So um, at the moment, matplotlib is just making the first scatter plot with its first default color and the second scatter plot with its second default color. And then when we change up to a different kind of plot, so using plot versus line or plot versus scatter, um, it starts the color cycle all over again. And you can also see some documentation about coloring in matplotlib here. But let's just see what happens if we move the order of the regression lines. So I'm going to go ahead and put the control line above the physics line. And just to see, we've got blue on top on the left up here and orange on the bottom. And then they cross. What happens if we change the order of those two lines? And now we have orange on the top and blue on the bottom. So uh, that's not good. All we've really done is switch up the order of things, but it can be pretty misleading. So we can avoid this by explicitly setting the colors like this. We'll make physics blue and we'll make control red. And we'll do the same to the lines. So we know that here's physics is still on top, control and bottom, physics first, control second, and make this blue. And we'll make this red. Okay, so we fixed the colors using matplotlib's built-ins for blue and red. And here we have some blue and red dots and lines, um, but those colors are not great. They do display the data, but they look a little bit ugly. So that is a perfect time to introduce Seaborn. So Seaborn is a, another Python data visualization library that is built on matplotlib. And what it does is it kind of wraps matplotlib and sits neatly on top, providing a high level interface for drawing attractive and informative statistical graphics. Um, it does a lot of things, but it is also a little bit clever. And that can kind of make things a little bit um, murky as to what it's actually doing. It makes things a little more opaque. So um, if you are ever in doubt, just remember that Seaborn is almost always going to return an axis object for you and that you can change those settings just as you would in matplotlib using many of the same functions because like I said, Seaborn just kind of like sits neatly on top. So um, one nice thing about Seaborn is that it integrates different types of plots to provide you with things you might like. So what we can do is we can recreate all that work we did above in matplotlib with just one function instead of plotting the scatter points, doing regression, making a line, plotting the line, we can just run the red plot function. But just a reminder that we imported the Seaborn as SNS. We already did this, so we don't really need to do it again, but just to refresh everybody's memory, there we have it. Okay, so one of the things that Seaborn does very nicely is colors. Um, there's a much nicer red and blue in the set one from the Color Brewer map, which if you're interested in, you can go ahead and follow this link. It will show you the Color Brewer maps. Um, but this is built into Seaborn. And so what you can do is we can get the RGB, or the red, green, blue values for the colors in this color map using Seaborn's color palette function. And then we can visualize them using the palette plot function. So using color palette, we are retrieving set one and five of its colors, and we're saving that as color list. We're going to go ahead and print each of the colors in color list, and then we are going to take a look at the palette. Just like this. All right, so there we have our RGB values and all five of the colors in color list. 
nicer than the matplotlib built in red and blue. So let's go ahead and change the colors in our plots. Instead of using red, we're going to use the variable color list that we made above. And we're going to select the first color, so this red for the red, and then I'm going to copy and paste. We're going to pick the second color, oops, second color for our blue. So red and And there we have it. That is much nicer. The red and the blue aren't quite so garish using these, these colors. Um, but wait, there's more. Like I mentioned earlier, we can replace all of this work and indeed all of these lines of code using just the regplot functions, regplot function from Sublime. So here we go. And we are going to go first, we're going to do post full scale IQ on the x axis and post. We'll do physics path length and the y-axis. Look at that. Much nicer. And if we do this twice in a row, just like with matplotlib, it will put both of these on the same axis. And there we have it. So not only do we have all of the points in the lines, we now have error bars too. And if we wanted to explicitly set the colors, we could do that using the same thing. Color equals color list. The first one. And then color equals color list. We've got our red and blue back. Ta-da! All right, so that is another, uh, still addressing our first objective. So we, now we can plot bivariate relationships in Seaborn. Nice. And now we can start really jazzing things up with Seaborn. Um, I like regplot more than those two matplotlib plots. I like that we have error bars, and I think that the defaults, the built-ins, just make things much more simple. If you can compare these two, this is a lot. This is much simpler and we didn't have to put in nearly as much work tweaking the lines and the colors as we did above. So, um, plus these colors are nicer. And there's a lot of different examples of the ways that you can change um, things up in Seaborn in their aesthetics tutorial, which you can look at if you click here. And you can go ahead and have, um, have a look and play around with those options. Um, there's really a lot you can do to change how things look in Seaborn. Um, we're going to look at a couple of those um, options now by setting the context and the style. So here we can go. Let's just use set context function. And this is going to set the size and font size of our plot and the dot size. And there are a few built in options. If you have a look here, we've got options like paper, notebook, talk, and poster that have some defaults built in. We're going to use poster for now. And we're also going to set the style. Um, one of the built-ins that you want to have is called dark grid. And now we don't have to explicitly set the colors in the plots anymore if we use set palette. We're going to use color list. But palette in the middle. Alrighty, so now all our defaults are set. Let's run our code again and remake our plot. This time including labels. Look at that. That is not what you want. Um, so the font's a little bit too big. Things are crowded. Dark grid isn't my style. Um, so let's go ahead and change to a notebook context. And we're going to use the ticks background. And we'll run our plotting code again. And look at that, we've arrived back at the matplotlib default. So if you like the matplotlib default, you can explicitly set notebook and ticks as your context and style. And all of the following plots will have this uh, style. So what we're going to do, I personally think the font should be a little bit bigger. So we're going to use the font scale attribute set to 1.5. It'll be just a little bit bigger. 
I also prefer white grid tips. So um, I'm also really picky about colors. And I think choosing colors is a fun, creative way to um, engage with your data. So two of my favorite color paletting options in Seaborn are the crayon palette and the hustle palette. But we're going to use the Crayola color names. I'm going to call crayons. Crayon palette. And now you just include a list of the crayon colors that you want. So I'm going to use red, orange, cerulean. So we're sticking with red and blue, but I like these red and blue a little bit better. And then we're going to use pal plot to take a look at these colors before we start using them. And there you have it, red and blue. I think they look a little bit nicer. And now we're going to use set palette once again, and we're going to set our palette to crayons. And that means that from here on out, our notebook wide color palette is these crayons. All right, and we're going to replot using the same, same code. And there you have it, white grid, bigger font, crayons. It looks pretty nice. Unfortunately, the legend is overlapping a couple of points. Um, but we could go ahead and change up the sizing to make that not the, not the case, but we're just going to move on for now. So uh, an important note is that when you run the set context and set style commands, what they do is they become the global settings for all the plots you make after running those commands. I personally like to include them at the top of the notebooks because I think it makes plots look nicer and I think it makes it easier for me to go back and find them and change them if I need to. Just keep them right at the top, right after the imports. Oh, and I also like despined palettes which gets rid of the top and the right uh, bounding box. So we're gonna use the Seaborn function dspine and just take those off. Ta-da, we have no line here and no top line here, but we do have the three line, which is very close to the top. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit more customization. Let's go ahead and have a look at our axes. They have ugly axis labels because those are just the names of the columns in our data frame but no one should have to interpret our ugly variable names. And if we want to make publication ready figures, we should really change those. So what we can do is we can use x.set x label, and we'll call the x axis full scale. Same for the y axis using set y label. And we're going to call that f. Okay, everything else is the same, so here we go. And that has given us nice labels. And this is a pretty good plot. Um, but one thing we can do if we want to customize it a little bit further is that we can change the minimum and maximum values for the axes on a figure. Right now, matplotlib is just guessing a good place to start and stop. Um, and it's doing a really great job, but if you only wanted to show like a subset of your data or you wanted to give the data a little bit more breathing room, you could change things. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at how to do that here um, using the axis limits. So I'm going to print those out. And we'll do the same for the y limits. Just change these guys really quick. All right, my mistake, those are functions. Yep. Here we go. And there, much nicer. So now we know that the x axis goes from about 79 and a half to about 153 and a half, whereas the y axis goes from negative 2.3 to 3, just like that. We can go ahead and change also the ticks on the axes. Um, we can set them explicitly if we wanted to. So right now it's going every 20 on the x-axis, but what if I wanted a little bit more detail? Set the x ticks. This will just take a list. So we're going to go 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, and 150. So now we have a tick every 10 on that axis. And there you have it. Uh, this looks a little busy to me, so I might go back to the defaults and just get rid of that line. Um, but what you can do if you want, so 
or you know the number of ticks you want, but you don't want to do the math and figure out where they should be, you can use the ticker locator params to put them in the best place for your data. So, locator params. We're going to say number of bins is six. No, oh, we're going to go four first. And the axis that we want to change is the y axis. And that'll give us four bins, one, two, three, four, but only three lines. Um, and that is not quite enough detail to really see what's going on here. So um, it's only given us three ticks, four bins. And let's see what happens. I think I want those six bins back. And change that to six. We're still talking about the y-axis. And there you have it. So now we've got our one, two, three, four, five, six bins back and all of our labels. Um, so one quick point to wrap up our, um, our label editing, our axis editing here, is that the x and y-axis limits are not the same as the tick locations. So the limits are the edges of the plot. You can kind of decide how wide and how tall it's going to be. Um, according to the scale, and the tick locations are where the actual markers are going to set on the axis. And as we saw, you can either change the values shown explicitly, or you can change the number of values shown. Okay, so let's move on to our second hypothesis. So in our second hypothesis, we suppose that the relationships between the brain and IQ might differ with respect to the course type, so whether students learned physics in an active learning class or a lecture class. Um, and to start exploring this hypothesis, we're going to go ahead and beef up our regressions. And what that means is I'm going to include interaction terms for IQ interacting with class type. I'm also going to include an interaction term for sex, so seeing if the relationship between IQ and path length differs or is different for uh, male and female students. And I'm also going to include a three term interaction. So is the relationship between IQ and path length different? for female and male students based on the class they were enrolled in. Let's find out. But we're also including head size and head movement and age and year in university as uh, covariates. So this is our, our fully fleshed out model. And here you can see we do have a, st a statistically significant relationship between path length and IQ. And it seems that we do have a number of significant parameters as well. So we might be in for some interesting plots lying ahead. Um, and we've done the same with uh, path length during the control condition and all of the same terms in the regression, except for the head movement, or yeah, head movement during the control. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and use plt.subplots again to see if we can add some panels to our figure. So now we are going to do two subplots. So we've got one row and two columns, which is going to give us two plots right next to each other. And they're going to share axes. And we're using the same plotting as above, with the same labels, and same everything. We have two plt.show commands, which I think is a little bit unnecessary. Alrighty, so that is a problem. We're going to go ahead and change this up a little bit. Because we are creating two different plots and we are going to want to manipulate the axes a little bit differently, we're going to have to specify which axis we plot these on. So we're going to do x zero. So now x is not one thing, x is two things because we say we have two columns. So now we're going to do x, we have to specify we want this one on x zero and this one on x one. And to make things easier when it comes to changing the labels, we're going to set these, or we're going to assign these names. So that's going to be G and that's going to be H. And now to set the X and Y labels, instead of setting them on X, because X is now two things instead of just one thing, that's why we got this error, we're going to go and manipulate G and H directly. So on G, we're going to do full scale IQ, and we're going to do path length. And G, if you recall, is our physics condition. So we're going to set this to physics. 
and then we'll go ahead and do the same for H. That'll be full scale Q. And the Y label will be half length. Now we have a plot. Ta-da! Two different colors, two different plots, physics and control. And they have the same axes. Um, but they are a little squished, so I think I'm going to go ahead and make it bigger. I'm going to use the fig size attribute, and this will take in um, the width and the height in arbitrary units. And there we have it. Now we've got a bit of a wider plot, so all the data fits a little bit nicer. We've got some breathing room. Looks good. And look at that, we made a two panel plot. So we are on our way to achieving our third objective. Um, Seaborn has really nice ways to make multi-panel plots. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use one of those other functions instead. So you can use, obviously you can use regplot to make a multi-panel plot, um, but Seaborn has a nice built-in called lmplot, which will further simplify our code. Um, however, Seaborn handles data a little differently. And this is one of those things that becomes a little bit murky when you switch from matplotlib to Seaborn. And so with regplot, it wanted our wide data where we had one row per participant and one column uh, per variable. But Seaborn wants long data when you use lmplot. And that can get a little bit tricky, but I'm going to show you all how to change from wide to long. So here's our wide data, one row per participant, one column um, per variable. We can make our data long by manipulating this data frame using pandas. And we're going to use the melt function what we're going to do is we're going to retain these three variables, so our um, class type, student sex, and IQ. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to make it long based on these two variables, so our path length variable. So instead now of having one row per, per participant, we're going to have two rows per participant. One row for the path length during the physics condition and one row for the path length during the control condition. And we're going to rename those physics and control just to make life easier. Alrighty, and so there's our long, our long data. Look at that. And what we're going to do next is we're going to replace the zeros and ones in our sex and class variables, uh, because once we're done, or we're done now, we're done writing stats, we're not going to do any more statistics. We're just on visualizing, and if we put informative values in here, then Seaborn can automatically display those values on our plots. Cool, so now we've got all the ones are now female, all the ones in class type are now active. And we're gonna move on and use lmplot instead of regplot. So let's do lmplot. And it takes the data in a little bit differently, but I'll show you how that looks. So we are gonna say that on our x axis, we still want post full scale IQ. On our y axis, we want path length. And we renamed this variable because now this is all the path lengths, remember, for both conditions. Um, and using lmplot, we have to specify that our data lives in our new data frame, which is df. We re renamed up here. df long. Cool. So now we can create those two subplots with just one line of code. Ooh, no, we couldn't. We could if we specified that we wanted to change column based on condition. There you go. So now we've got our physics condition over here and our control condition over here. It did all the sizing for us and it plotted both of our data. So now what we're going to do is we're going to see what the relationships between path length and IQ look like during the different conditions in the separate classes. And we're going to further uh, flesh out this plot. So now we've got it separated by condition. We're going to further separate by student sex and color based on class type. So we're going to do row equals sex and Q. So it's going to be different colors based on class type. So now instead of two plots, we have four plots, one, two, three, four. So this is female students during the physics condition, female students during the control condition, male students during the physics condition, and male students during the control condition. And instead of being colored based on condition, we are doing colors based on our lecture and active learning classes. Cool. 
Um, but again, we have some plots with some ugly labels and variable names. So what we're going to do is we're going to edit these guys a little bit. And the spacing is kind of weird, right? So the spacing seems to be appropriate on this plot. But since all the plots are sharing their axes, these guys are a little, a little empty. Um, and what you can do is you can adjust um, so that we're no longer sharing axes. Of course, if you want the axis labels to be consistent across plots, um, you can keep them like this. There's completely valid reasons to do so. But if you're going for aesthetics and you want um, each of the plots to fill up its axis, you can go ahead and do share y equals plots and share x equals plots. Alrighty, and now each of the plots takes up its full axis. We have the same labels on the axes, but they are not on the same, uh, they're not spaced apart equally, they don't quite line up. Alrighty, so now we're going to go ahead and fix those labels. It's a little bit trickier because we're not directly manipulating the axes anymore. Instead, we're manipulating an object created by lmplot that contains the axes. So instead of set, set y label and set x label, we're having, we have to use the functions that are built into lmplot. Um, so these are set titles and set access labels. And in order to access these functions, I've now saved this lmplot as the variable j. So we can go j.set titles. And this is going to give us a template for um, these titles on top of each plot. So we're going to a template. And what we want to do is I'm going to go for a variable that should, that um, holds the row name and then students. So that'll be either female or male students. And then we're going to go with the call name. So either physics or control condition. And so we'll have for this plot, for example, we'll have male students physics condition instead of sex equals male and condition equals physics. We're going to go ahead and set the label access labels all at once. Instead of using set y label and set x label for each of these subplots, we can just use set access labels. X is full scale IQ and Y is path. There we go. And there we have it. And you know what we've done is we've made a multi-panel publication ready figure using Matplotlib and Seaborn. Mission accomplished. Um, but of course, what would these pretty plots be if we couldn't save them? But don't worry, we can. Using the save fig option, we can give it a name. So we're gonna, for a file path, I'm gonna save it in figures and I'm gonna call this, um, do scatter plus lines dot png. And I think my favorite part, the thing that makes these actually like publication quality figures is I can also set the dots per inch. So now we have a high resolution figure and it's been saved. You can also save as different uh, file formats. So if you like vectors, you can save it as an SVG. If um, the journal has requirements for what format, you can specify TIFF or JPEG, totally up to you. Um, and that brings us to the end of Matplotlib and Seaborn. Um, but there are so many more options in Seaborn. You can do, you can plot distributions in a bunch of different ways. You can plot a whole bunch of different line plots, which are great for time series. Um, you can show block, box plots, swarm plots, and rainfall or violin plots where you can compare distributions and check for outliers. They have radial plots now, which I just discovered um, in editing this tutorial, and of course, heat maps. So lots of options. You can go ahead and scroll through Seaborn's example gallery, which was linked earlier in the presentation. But we're going to go ahead and go back. And now it's time to plot some brain plots. So we've talked a lot about path length, which we derived from the fMRI data, but we've only made scatter plots. Um, I think it's time to make some brain plots. So we can spend just as much time doing this, but we're going to spend a little bit less time. Um, and once again, just a reminder that we have imported 
um, from Nylern, the plotting module. And there are a bunch of different plotting functions. We are going to just look at a few of them. You can plot anatomical and functional images using PlotNAT and PlotEPI. You can display results using plot stat map, plot glass brain, and if you have connectome results or connectivity between brain regions, you can even use plot connectome. Um, and for this example, we are going to actually just use some data that's built into Nylearn. So we're no longer using that physics learning data. Now we're going to use data from the Haxby data set, which is accessible in um, Nylearn using the fetch Haxby function. Um, what this is going to do is it is going to download some data from pymppa.org and let us use that data. Importantly, we are grabbing data from a motor task and we are grabbing statistical images from that. So we're just going to grab one statistical image and use that as our example to plot. So there are a few different ways that we can visualize these results. We can either put them on a glass brain, plotting, plot, glass brain. That inch right here. And that gives us a plot on a glass brain with three different views. Um, because we haven't thresholded it, it looks a little bit ugly with all that yellow. So I'm going to go ahead and threshold it at two. See how that looks. There you go, a little bit better. If we wanted to know what those colors mean, we could either even tell it that we want a color bar. And look at that, very nice. Um, in addition to a glass brain, we can plot things on an MNI template brain using plot. Use the same statistical image and the same threshold. And we also want a color bar. And this will give us a statistical map in slices instead of this glass brain uh, view, which looks through the brain from each of these vantage points. Um, there we go. Ta da! Um, so we've got an orthographic view with a coronal slice, a sagittal slice, and an axial slice. And um, Nylon just chose what it thought would be the best ones. You can, of course, change these and you can change the views. So we're going to go ahead and take that command, that same plotting command, but I'm going to change it up a little bit. So instead, we are going to go and change the display mode to only show us axial slices. Takes a little bit to get going, and there we have it. So we've got seven axial slices. But what if I only wanted five? We can use the cut chords attribute and say, I just want five, please. And that will replot our statistical image into just five slices. One, two, three, four, five. Very nice. Alrighty, we could also change up the colors if we wanted to. Um, these are pretty nice, but what if I wanted to use, we're gonna use the CMAP attribute, and I'm gonna say, I want the ABCD color map. Let's see what we got. Oh no, we get a huge error message. But if you scroll to the bottom, what it's gonna say is, hey, there is no ABCD color map. However, you can use any of these options. And I think that this is probably the best error message I've ever read because um, it just, by being a little bit wrong, you can get the whole list of right answers. Um, so there are a lot of things that are built into matplotlib and different commonly used color maps from here and there. I think I'm gonna, bring, I'm gonna choose ocean because that sounds like fun. So now we're going to use cmap equals whoop ocean. Let's see what that looks like. Taking its time. Nice. All right. So that's a pretty color map. It's a little bit less informative because the colors don't automatically signify positive and negative, but it looks like an ocean. So pros and cons. Um, and of course, we can go ahead and save this as if it was a matplotlib figure because 
Um, it sort of is actually. It isn't entirely, but it sort of is. Um, so we can use this save fig like we did before. I'm going to put it in figures. I'm going to call it ocean. And again, we can specify dots per image or dots per inch. So we can make sure that the map that we've saved is a high resolution map, which makes it publication quality. All right, um, and slices are nice, but I really like visualizing things on surfaces. Um, but luckily, we can do that too. And not only that, but Nylearn has built in um, the free server average surface, which we can go ahead and use with this fetch surf fs average command. Run that guy, and now we've downloaded that. So we're going to import the surface module from Nylearn. And we're going to um, project this statistical map onto the surface. Um, and if you were going to do this for analyses reasons, you might um, include a few more options here. But because I know these are in the same stereotactic reference space, I don't actually need to do that. Alrighty, so now our stat map is saved as the texture. And we are going to use the plot surf stat map. I'm going to set that as an object called L plotting plot surf step map. And what this wants is a few different things. It wants a surface mesh. So this is the um, surface that we're going to project everything onto. It wants a, a statistical map. And it wants a background map if you have one. It wants to know what hemisphere you want to see, what view. It wants to know a lot of things. But we're just going to use a few of these different things. So. We want our background map to be the FS average. I think I'm going to go with the inflated left. It's because we've projected our volume to a surface in the right hemisphere. I want to visualize it on the inflated right hemisphere. Um, we're going to use the texture as our stat map, which we made right up here. And then I'm going to say the hemisphere is right. I'm going to give it a title, two little titles. Um, and and of course, you can make that a little bit more um, informative if you wanted to. I do want a color bar once again. And the background map. is going to be our circle, our, uh, yeah, our circle boundaries. So. Threshold it the same as we did on the previous. Oh. Of course, I want to do the LDAP show. And we're going to fix whatever error. Oh, it's in uh, yeah. There you go. Alrighty then. And here we have a stat map. We've got a surface view of the statistical image that we shared above. Let's go ahead and compare it, compare it to a plot of slices using the same threshold. And there you have it. Uh, my personal favorite way to display neuroimaging results like these is with both the surface and the slices. And if you want, you can use this change the view. So we've got a lateral view right now. I want a medial view. Uh, and of course, you can save these using l.savefig like you did above. And finally, if you want to get really fancy, you can plot a surface that is interactive using plot view surf. So we're going to go ahead and get a shot. I'm going to call this view. This is a really great tool if you want to um, visualize your results. I find this really handy in like making sense of results. Again, we're going to use the inflated right hemisphere. Our texture is going to be loaded on top. 
controls is the same and the background map is the same. See what this looks like. Ta da! Alrighty, so now we've got that statistical map on the same surface, and now we can change the view however we want. This is really handy for understanding your results, and you can use it to make figures if you had a specific view that you wanted. Maybe you wanted kind of like an angle from the front, angle from the back. Got options. And this uh, interactive visualizer is built on Plotly, so it's got a lot of those same options right up here. You can even download this plot as a PNG if you click this button right here. Um, and that's it, that's our show. So now we've learned how to plot bivariate relationships using Matplotlib and Seaborn, as well as how to plot statistical brain maps using a few different options in Nylearn. And if you're interested in more um, ways to plot in Nylearn, you can look through their plotting gallery. It goes through each of the functions, some of which I didn't get to. Um, this is our plot connectome that, like I mentioned, but it has a lot, a lot of different options and a lot of very thorough tutorials about how to change the individual settings so you can get exactly the plots you want. Alrighty. And with that, thanks so much for, for watching, listening, and following along.